of the page. And then I want images. Uh, I should that's enough. The basics of CSS. And the thing as we talk is that your CSS should have with the appearance page in the CSS. Now, the things as far as the and do not there are things or put or things like can do. Uh, uh, and this is This is just an example. And I didn't go necessarily look good together. I just went for colors. So here's the page as we view it. About graphics. If we were to look open, all five, then I can open this. You'll see that dish. is not H T. It's it. all right. And it be used to determine the appearance of the page. Each one of these things you could call all, and each step a select. Then it for characteristic, and then there's a between the name of the and the, then there's a set before the pair. And these are pretty makes them, right the brand, but to expect has to understand it. So indicate colon blue. So that, and the color means the color. Being white. is easily four times the semester and this is like the what two times three six class. 
so happy we haven't had a good mic in here. I, I do apologize, apparently, again, we're having mic problems. Um, we were just reviewing the stuff that we went over last time with CSS code, and we were talking about how the CSS code um, consists of, within a style tag, there is um, a rule, uh, or a set of rules, and the rules consist of a um, selector, which determines what gets the rule, followed by pairs of attributes and values. So in this case, the background is blue, the text color is yellow. I am real quick going to view this in Chrome instead, because there's a slight browser compatibility issue that I don't want to talk about right now. There we go. All right. Article then has a color of white. What does that mean? It means the text is going to be white. Now the background color for the article is blue. Why? Well, that cascaded down from the body. In other words, the rule for the body gives everything in the body that background. So unless it's overridden, everything in the body will have that background and will have that text color. Well, the article, because the article is contained within the body, that overrules the body's rule for the article. So we have the text color of white. Likewise, for paragraphs, we have a background of red. And the paragraphs that are within an article have a color of white and a background of red. All right? It takes a little bit of time and planning to do this efficiently, all right? um, to, to set the rules in, in such a way. Because you don't have to put a rule on every single thing. You can put a rule on the body, and that will take effect for every tag within the body, and then if you want to overrule it for certain tags, you can. And you can overrule it in parts, right? You can, for example, I declared a background color, or I'm sorry, I declared a color for article, but I didn't declare a background color. So it gets the background color from the body, and it gets the text color from the article. Again, the rules are applied the same way that it's nested. The more specific the, the, the tag is, that rule takes precedence over the, the, the tag that contains it. Any questions about this? Yes? Does it have to be um, style in between um, title and head? The, 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 the style tag is within the head section. Okay. It doesn't have to be after the title. You could put it before, but it should be in the head section. If you didn't, it probably would still work, but it's wrong to do that. You should put it in the head section. Later on, probably next week, we're going to learn about how we can make a CSS file and uh, separate from the HTML. And then we can use the same CSS file for a whole, every one of our pages. So we can make all 20 or 100 or however many pages we have look the same simply by using one CSS file. All right. Now, blue, yellow, white, red, gray, I mean, those are common colors. All right. What are the colors that you're allowed to use? Well, there is. You search for HTML color names, you'll see a whole list of all the colors that you can use. Look at this one. So, I could say I want the background to be tomato. Instead of red. a little bit different. I should have did that for this. So it made a more dramatic difference. Alright. So there's a whole bunch of names. And I don't expect you to like memorize these names. You know, you look them up if you know. Or if you want to know. Like, you know, gee, I want it to be kind of a, you know, a a dark green. Well, Instead of memorizing all these, just say, well, let's see. Let me look on the chart. 
Oh, hey, there you go, dark green, all right? Or forest green or sea green or, or whatever. Now, if you notice next to the name, there's a six-digit code. It's a combination of numbers and letters. In addition to all these colors that have a name, there's actually a whole bunch of colors that you can reference and that you can create that don't have names but have a code associated with them. How many of you have ever like, gotten paint for your house? All right. Do they have every single color in the store? You know, they have all those color charts for you. Do they have every single color pre-made and ready for you to go in the store? No, what do they do? They mix the shade based on some rules. A couple drops of this, a couple drops of that, and boom, you have sienna or whatever. All right? With HTML, it's the same way. All right? Not every color has a name, but you can reference a whole bunch of colors using the code. And I'm going to take a minute to explain how the code works. And here's the good news. If you don't understand a word I'm saying, that's okay. Just know to use the code. All right? The code works like this. It's six digits. I should say six characters, but no. Well, characters, digits, whatever. So let's look at, for example, let's look at maroon. We'll look at some of these. We'll look at maroon. For maroon, the color is 80000. are actually three pairs of digits. I forgot that zero. I mean, there we go. They tell you how much of three primary colors there are that make up this color. It tells you how much red, green, and blue are in it. You can get any color you want by mixing red, green, and blue light. Okay, just by varying how much red, green, and blue light you have in here. Now, these are not like decimal numbers. You know, in our decimal number, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. These are what are called hexadecimal numbers. All right? In decimals, you have 10 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In hexadecimal, you have 16 digits. And they get their number like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That part stays the same. Then you start using letters. A, B, C, D, E, F. So F is the highest hexadecimal digit. So F's mean turned up all the way. All right? And just like decimals, if we saw the number 95, the 9 is the bigger digit, right, than the 5. The 9 represents 9 tens, and the 5 represents 1s. Well, in hexadecimal, if I had A5, the A represents how many 16s there are, and the 5 represents how many 1s. So this would actually be like 165. Another way to put it is, just like in decimal, 0, 9 is smaller than 9, 0, because that's the bigger digit. 0, A is smaller than A, 0. So this is the bigger, more important digit. All right, so the three pairs of digits say how much red, green, and blue are in there. So if I look at... Uh, um, what would the highest amount of red be? If it was decimal, it would be, a, it would be 9, 9. In hexadecimal, the highest value would be AA. So AA would be the highest amount of red. So AA0000 zero, 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 zero would be like the brightest shade of red there is. The most vivid, the reddest red. 
8, 0, is that bigger or smaller than AA? It's smaller. So what does that mean? It's, it's what kind of red? It's a darker red. It would be like if you had a light, a spotlight that was on a, uh, um, like a slider where you didn't have to turn on or off, but you could like give more or less of it. 8, 0 is less than AA, so it's not really bright red, it's a darker red, which is exactly what maroon is. A darker red. Let's see. See, there's red. FF0000. That's a very bright red. Maroon down here, which I don't know why they put it under browns, but it's 8000. So it's a darker one. All right? So, let's do some more examples to see if we got it. What would FF00 FF be? Well, our three pairs. Is there a little or a lot of red? A lot. Is there a little, or a, is, is, there, is there a lot of green? No, there's no green at all. Is there a lot or a little of blue? A lot. So what color would this be? This would be a shade of purple. Now, what if I did something like this? Eight zero 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 FF. Pardon me? It would be a darker purple, and it would be a bluer purple. All right, we can look at the chart here. Let's go to the purple section. All right, FF00FF, actually they're calling fuchsia. All right, whereas uh, 8B008B is a darker shade, and then if we look at indigo, indigo, there's more blue than red, so this is a bluish shade, and so on. Then we have all these other combinations as well. Plum, believe it or not, there's a little green in it. Some of these things are a little counterintuitive. For example, if you mix red and green, you get yellow. All right, that's the way it works with light. All right, now, the good news is, is that you can be a really successful web developer without, memor without even having any idea how this works. If you see a color you like, gee, I like this dark slate blue. Just copy and paste the code. So I can copy it, and I could paste it in here. The only difference is, is when, you use the, when you use the code, you put a pound sign in front of it to say the background pound sign, and then you put the code. So even if you don't understand how that works, you can still use it to your advantage. And again, if I wanted to make this brighter, I could make these numbers bigger. So maybe I'll make it 6A, A, E. That's a bigger value. So this should be a brighter color. Sure enough, it got a little bit lighter, simply by adding more light to it. The higher the number, the more light there is to it. Now, I mentioned last time that people sometimes say, well, you know, I'm not good at um, matching colors. I'm not artistic and, and all that is, is difficult for me. And I said not to worry, because there's a science to it. There's actually science about what makes colors look like they match together and go together. All right. And there's any number of tools available that allow you to use like a color wheel. Back in the old days, these were actually like paper wheels that artists would have, where you would turn them and you would, you would say, if I'm using this shade of red, this shade of something else would go with it well. So if we go here and Google HTML, HTML color scheme generator, We'll see several of these 
tools that will allow us to pick a set of colors. Now, there are several different kinds of color schemes that you could have. And unfortunately, this doesn't show up real well um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the screen. But if you like Googled it and viewed it on your monitor, it's a little easier to read. But there's monochromatic, which is all shades of the same color. So notice that I could pick, I wanted a green theme. And it's going to give me a bunch of different shades of green. There's also what they call um, adjacent colors, where the colors are similar, but not the same shade. So they're related. They're different shades of green and blue in this case. There are triads, which are three sort of colors, tetrads, which are four colors, and then freestyle, where you sort of just make it on your own. Let's stick with the simple one, monochromatic. First of all, we could decide on the basic color we want our page. So let's say I want it to be A shade of blue. What it will do then is if I click this, it shows me the different codes that are involved. And so, for example, the lightest blue is this one. So maybe I'll make that the background of my page. Maybe I'll make the headings in this color. Or rather the articles in this color. Or the paragraphs. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Now, one of the colors notice here is zero, 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 zero. What do you suppose that color is? It's black. So I could say black or I could say pound sign zero, 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 zero. That's all the lights turned off, right? You could think of red, green, and, and, and blue spotlights shining on a wall. If all the lights are off, then the screen's going to be black. If all the lights are on full blast, it's going to be white. And so white would be what? F, 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 F. All right? So you could either do that or you could refer to it by the color name. Now, as a rule, you don't want to go crazy with the color, right? Um, we've just learned how to make every single thing on our page look different, right? You probably don't want to do that, right? Because that's, you know, that is chaotic, right? You use color to help the user sort of organize your page mentally, all right? So when they look at the page, they see how it's divided into sections and so on and so forth. So use colors judiciously. Don't simply use colors just because, hey, I know how to make a million different colors, so I'm going to use all million of them in every single page. Pick a few colors, and you always sort of get white and black for free. So no matter what your color scheme is, you can always add white or black or really any neutral like gray you could add to it, and it really wouldn't matter. Is it better to use the color names or the color codes? Well, again, uh, keep in mind, there, there really is no difference. What would make it different would be how well you would understand it um, and, and, and readability. Keep in mind, there's not a name for every color code, right? There's a few hundred color names. I don't know exactly how many, but there's probably a few hundred where there are literally millions of colors that you can generate via the code. So not every code has a name associated with it, all right? But you can mix and match. I mean, I can leave that as white instead of putting in pound sign FF, FF. F. Um, what I would use is I would use whatever I thought would be easier for me to understand later on. I 
I'd probably use the codes more often because like, you know, chartreuse. What color is chartreuse? I don't know what color chartreuse is. So seeing the name isn't helpful, but seeing the hex code, I can say, okay, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of red, a lot of green, and a little bit of blue, or whatever. All right, so I'm going to go here, and I'm going to use these colors. Again, notice it gave us, <coughs> what, six colors? Which you might think isn't really a lot, but it really is. And if we look at this, we'll see our page. Well, it might not be perfect. It is going to look a lot nicer than it did initially. Actually, I changed my mind. It is perfect. We're done. No, just kidding. Um, but you notice again, it, it looks it looks a lot better than the random collection of it. And it probably looks better than, to be honest, colors if I just manually chose the colors myself. All right? So that's a good resource to use. And again, just Google Color Scheme Generator. There's any number of them available on the web. And um, you know, every web developer sort of has their own um, you know, set of tools that they like and resources that they go to. Um, and it's important to have these because it's, it's impossible to memorize everything and it's impossible to do everything. So if you can look it up quickly, then, then that's just as good. All right, questions on this. Now on to images. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and find an image of a groundhog. Now images is one thing that you could take the picture yourself for your website, in which case you own the copyright for it. Or if you're going to go online and do it, that's something that you definitely would want to give a credit for. So I'm going to Google Groundhog. Here, let's pick this one. This one looks happier. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. It's rabbit. Yeah, right, right. I don't know. I never realized groundhogs were this scary a creature. <laughs> I'll just pick this one. This guy there isn't going to hurt anyone. All right. It's the saddest so, groundhog ever. Yeah, really. <laughs> that looks like... You ever, you ever like go to carnivals where they have the things that you throw the ball at and try to knock them down? That kind of looks like one of those, except those are even skid those are usually skiddier because they don't want you to be able to hit it. But, yeah, yeah, there you go. So I can write mouse and I'm going to say save image. And I'm going to put it in the same folder as my web page is. Right now, we're putting everything in the same folder. We're going to keep it easy. All right. Then when you're done, you can zip up that folder and upload it to me. Now here again is where I mentioned uh, at the way at the beginning of class that it's best to have um, the file extensions visible, right? Because this is a JPEG, but actually JPEG files could end several different ways. Some JPEG files are .jp, .jp, .jpg. Some of them are .jpe. Some of them are .jpeg, all right? So just knowing it's a JPEG file does not give you the complete name of it. So I'm going to go up here and make sure that I have the right name of it by going to Folder and Search Options, <coughs> View, Turn Off Hide Extensions, and sure enough, it's a .jpg, all right? And I'm also going to remember where I got this from. All right. Okay. So now, if I want to put an image on here, the tag for an image is IMG. And images are like links in that 
you have to specify what image you're going to put there, right? There's a million images on the internet, literally. There are billions of images on the internet. And even your own website could have a whole bunch of images. You have to tell the browser which one of those images you want to display. So you have to give the name of the image. All right? And the name of the image you put in as the SRC attribute. Now again, S, we, we've seen attributes with links where we have the href attribute. Attributes on tags, remember, give you additional information about the tag. All right? We have a link. Well, a link to what? Here we have an image. Well, which image? So if I say I have a paragraph, that's all I need to say. So paragraphs don't have to have any attributes other than a paragraph. I have a paragraph. <coughs> all right, fine. Here's the title of my page. Fine. But links and images need extra information about it for it to work. So with links, there's actually the href attribute where you say what you're linking to. With images, there's the SRC attribute where you put in the file name of the image. And you gotta get a you gotta match it right. Alright. There's one other thing that we'll talk about when we talk about accessibility, and that's we usually put an alt attribute. And an alt attribute is an explanation of what the image is for people that are accessing your page using a screen reader. All right? Someone that's blind can't see your web page, but they have software that can actually read the web page to them. Well, how can it read an image to them? It can't, right? That's why you supply an alt attribute and the screen reader will read that to them. So usually it's just a very short description, picture of a groundhog. Now, for now I'm going to do this with my image tag. I'm just going to close it. Image is one of the few tags, there's a couple of tags like this, that don't need a start and end tag. You can just put the tag in itself. You could put the end image tag in and it wouldn't hurt. So you could do this. And that's okay. Or you could leave out the ending image tag. And that's okay. Or you can actually do this, which tells me that, which tells the browser that this is a starting and ending tag rolled into one. So you have options on how to do that. Now again, you can't do that with every tag. Image is one of the few tags that really doesn't need an ending tag, so you can do it either of those three ways. So now I go and do this and look at it. Oh, I'm going to go and grab the credit for it. And I'm going to make my credit a link. <clears throat> and again, I can line it up however I think makes it readable. Now I go and view my page. Yeah. Groundhog day dot day. It's actually hard to talk and type at the same time. There we go. 
How would you resize that, or would that be CSS? Um, good question. Let's hold on that thought for a second. The one thing I want, I do want to address is notice that my footer now becomes difficult to read. All right, so I would want to go in and correct that by maybe saying, footer, background, white, or something. Oh, it's a paragraph, it's not the footer, duh. All right. We're gonna learn a new selector. Footer P. What do you suppose that does? Paragraphs in the footer? Paragraphs inside the footer. So this is every paragraph. This is the paragraphs inside the footer. So which one of them is going to apply to the paragraphs inside the footer? Well, this one, because that's the more specific rule. All the paragraphs on the page get this, but for the paragraphs within the footer, this one overrules. And again, it cascades down. So if I had something on this that wasn't on that, it would the, the paragraph main one would apply. So there we go. Now, the question of resizing the image. Yes, you can resize it via CSS. Um, typically what you would want to do though is you would want to actually resize the image itself. All right? Because if I have a gigantic image, like this is not a big image at all. Let's, let's, let's find another image. I still think this guy looks happy. All right. Maybe he's happy because he's going to eat you. That's a big image. So let's say save as, and I'll save it in the same folder. This image is 436 kilobytes. All right, that's half a meg, all right? That's a decent sized image, all right? Now, if I used CSS to make it smaller, and if I look at it, it is 940 pixels wide by 626 pixels tall. Does everyone know what a pixel is? It's a dot on the screen, all right? And the way this, monitor is set, there's about, there's probably like uh, 1,280 pixels going across, I would think, or maybe 1,000 and some, 1,080, something like that, pixels going across. So this goes almost all the way across the screen. And it's about a half a meg, which is a decent size for a picture. Now, if I were to use CSS to, 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 to resize it and make it smaller, maybe make it 200 pixels wide, the browser would still download the, the full 400,000 pixel or 4,000 bytes of it. So normally what I would do is if I wanted to resize it, I would go into a photo editor and make it a smaller image. That way it doesn't download the whole gigantic picture only to make it small. All right? It would be like, you know, I don't know, you know, downloading a high def video and watching it on your Apple Watch or something like that, right? It's like it's, like it's kind of a waste because it's going to make it small anyhow. You're better off with a lower resolution. All right. Maybe that was a bad analogy, but, but you get the idea. All right. So what you would do is you would go into a photo editor uh, and do that. We will go over examples uh, of that, uh, of, of how to do that. Um, because, you know, you don't have to be a whiz at Photoshop or any of the, the tools. But if you're a web developer, you should be able to um, resize a photo, um, you know, without, um, you, you know, without uh, too much difficulty. In fact, let's do that now. That was as good a time as any. Let's put the second photo on the page.
I think that I think that's gonna haunt me in my dreams tonight. And you see, it's gigantic. What I would do if I want to make it smaller is, first of all, I would take a copy of the original and stash it somewhere. Right? Once you make an image smaller, you can't make it bigger again. You've lost that information. All right? You've lost that information. So if you make it small and make it big, it's going to become what's called pixelated. It's going to look like blocks. It's the, the lines aren't going to be smooth. And we'll actually demonstrate that to show you uh, what I mean. But what I can do is I can go in then and edit this in whatever photo editor we happen to have on this machine. Good old Microsoft Paint. All right. And I can go in here to resize the image. And I can either say I want it to be a certain number of pixels <coughs> or I can make it a certain percentage of the current side size. Let's make it 10% of the current size. I want to really make it small. That's kind of too small. Make it 20%. Now what you want to do is you want to maintain aspect ratio when you're resizing it, right? What that means is aspect ratio is the ratio of the height and width. If I distort that, if I don't maintain it and give it a different number, then the page, then the picture will either look like really stretched out or really squashed together. So if I make the horizontal 20% and the vertical 40%, he gets all stretched out. So you want to make that. You want to keep those two together as you resize it. That is a pet peeve of mine when people resize images, if they don't do that right. It, that, that looks so amateurish to see a picture where the person is either really spread out or really uh, squashed together or stretched out or whatever. So I'm going to go and save this. I've kept a copy of it, all right? And now when I go and view the page, it looks a little more reasonable, all right? Now, the reason I said that you, you, you don't want to, um, you want to have the original is, what if I were to say, gee, I want this to be a little bit bigger. You know, I want it to be the same height as this guy. If I went into the original again, I mean, I'm sorry, if I went into the copy that I've resized and said, I want to make this 250%, Notice, looks horrible, all right? Because when you made it smaller, you lose information. We took that file, which was 400,000 bytes, and we've compressed it to being 16,000. So we got rid of a lot of detail in that image by compressing it. So once that detail's gone, it's gone. You can't make it bigger again. So if I did want to make this picture bigger again, I'd start again with the original and resize it to match up the height of the other <coughs> one. So for example, this image would be 300 pixels tall. So what I might do is Take my original again, copy it over, edit this, and make this guy 300 pixels tall. And then when I view the page, same size. I'm going to grab a credit of this one to put on my page.
Now we have our credits to that and the images. All right, now notice, again, this, I wouldn't call this like a professional quality web page yet. I mean, there's still a lot of stuff that we could do to make it look better still. But compare this to how it looked like when we came in today. And then compare that to how it looked before we even started playing with CSS. And we've really gone a long way just by adding images and controlling the color and, and, uh, of the page to making it look more, more personal, for one thing, more distinct, and more professional looking. So we'll just continue along this path and make it even more and more as we add things to our CSS skill sets, all right, and as we learn more HTML. Any questions at this point? We'll spend a little bit more time talking about images on Monday. No, we won't. I might, but you won't hear it because you won't be here because our class is on Tuesday and Thursday. All right? So Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday, we'll spend a little more time talking about images, and then we'll go on to whatever the next topic is, maybe more CSS. Yes? Is there a way, instead of like calling to a uh, link, like to make it go to the bottom of the page, instead of like saying, Right. Uh, is there a way, in, you know, like to go to the top of the page, just the pound sign? Yes. Is there a way to go to the bottom, like just simple like that? Not that I'm aware of. Not that, not that I'm aware. I know pound signs at top. I don't believe there's a shortcut like that for the bottom. I, I, I it's possible. I, you know, there is, and I don't know it. But typically, I've seen an ID like that. So basically, you just have to set the ID to the put an ID. Yeah, put an ID at, at whatever's at the very bottom of the page, like the footer or whatever, and then you can you can jump right to that. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab. Oh, one last thing. I lied. Notice how I kept everything in a single folder. All right, so this is my folder. The HTML is in it, and both images are in it. I can then zip that, and that would be what I would turn in if this were an assignment. Because I need all the files. I need the images, I need the HTML. Later on when we make CSS files, I'll need those too. So keep everything in a folder. Zip up the whole folder, and that's what you'll upload to Canvas. All right, we'll see you in lab. <coughs>